This is, this is war. And war needs to be ended quickly, thoroughly, systematically. So no matter what Israel does in the days to come, and it could be weeks, I don't know what they're thinking, it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be justified. Israel needs to unleash hell on Iran. It needs to destroy as much of its nuclear capability as Israel can, assuming Israel can't get everywhere because of the depth at which some of these facilities are at. Fine, leave them, take out everything else. Israel needs to destroy, again, to the extent that it's capable the ballistic missile launching capabilities of the Iranians. It needs to destroy as much of the, you know, uh, uh, revolutionary guard as it can from the air. And it needs to completely debilitate the Iranian economy by taking out as many power plants, bridges, uh, and of course, the oil fields and oil facilities in Iran. And it needs to do all that yesterday. And every day it waits is less effective. Every day it waits. More international pressure against it doing anything will, will accumulate. The more it waits, the more hesitant it looks, the weaker it looks, and so on. It's bizarre that Israel did not have a a, a, a detailed, systematic plan on exactly how to respond to the latest ballistic missile launch. Of course, they shouldn't have needed to wait to respond. Now, it could, the only excuse I can think for Israel right now is, the only excuse I can think. So they had the plans. They should have had the plans. They knew exactly what they needed to do. They know where to send the airplanes. They know what the targets are. I don't know why the night the missiles rained in on Israel, the planes weren't in the air and on the way to Tehran and on the way to executing the mission. Now, you know, there are a few possible explanations here. Uh, three of them, w only one good one. One, Biden really squeezed the Israelis, really squeezed them. We'll get to Biden, back to Biden in a little bit. But really, I don't know, threatened them with no more munitions, something devastating that they just couldn't, they couldn't, you know, ignore. Two, probably the likeliest. This is consistent with the pattern with Bibi Netanyahu just hesitating and waiting and chewing and talking and discussing and debating and asking the Americans over and over again, are you sure? What do you want? How do you do it? Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da, for, 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 for a long time before new, dramatic, significant action is taken. The third option, which is the best option in the sense that it, it, it explains this without uh, making Israel and the Americans look like complete losers, is the possibility that Israel just has higher priorities right now. That is, it's airplanes, it has limited capacity in terms of Air Force and intelligence and reconnaissance and everything else. It is right now engaged in two ground wars, one in Gaza and one in South Lebanon. And it is engaged in, uh, you know, uh, bombing campaigns, that is, Air Force activity, both in Gaza and in South Lebanon. And importantly, it's engaged in, uh, you know, Air Force activity, significant Air Force activity, all over Lebanon, including Syria. There, there have been a number of bombings in the Damascus area. And then for the first time, it really interesting, they bombed a part of a naval base in uh, Syria, in, in the northwest of Syria, on the Mediterranean, a base that is mostly dedicated to Russian troops, facilities, equipment, and Navy, jointly operated with the Syrians, but a very, very heavy Russian presence. Now, Israel did not attack that part of the port. They attacked a part of the port that had Hezbollah and, and, uh, and uh, its allies' presence. But 
wow, Israel got very close to a, a, a significant Russian presence in Syria. I mean, one of the reasons Russia intervened in the Syrian civil war and intervened on the side of Bashar al-Assad was in order to preserve its uh, base in Syria, which is its base in the Mediterranean, which allows it to project some naval power, not that it has much, but whatever naval power it has, into the Mediterranean in a port in, Le in uh, Syria. Well, Israel attacked part of that port. Again, not the part run by the Russians. But that's about as close as Israel's bombed, you know, a Russian facility. And then finally, and, and this is, you know, Israel has been pounding just pounding um, Southeast Beirut, whether it's the area around the airport or whether it's the Shiite neighborhoods, the neighborhoods dominated by the Shiites and Hezbollah all around, uh, all around, uh, uh, all over the, the, the Southeast, Southwest. Uh, they are telling the, the, the buildings that they're going to bomb to evacuate. And then they're going in and destroying those buildings. In the most meaningful attack in Beirut, I mean, they've been attacking all over Beirut, primarily in the south, in, in the Hezbollah areas. But in the most meaningful attack in Beirut this evening, uh, Israeli airplanes hit three high-rise buildings with a bunker underneath them, at least the size and the depth of the bunker in which they killed Nasrallah. It's hard to tell how many bombs Israel leveled at this place in order to completely and utter destroy it. We're talking about a incredibly deep bunker. Uh, you know, they, they probably used something like 80 bombs to destroy, 80, 80 from airplanes to destroy the bunker Nasrallah was in. Uh, they're probably using something similar tonight. Now, we'll get to why they're doing that in a minute. But you can imagine that with that kind of focus for the Air Force, that kind of focus of using heavy bombs, um, Israel is just, uh, the Air Force is just too busy right now to start a, another front in Iran to travel a thousand miles uh, to, uh, to Iran and, and uh, execute missions over there. And it, even if they do do that, it's going to be very hard to execute on the kind of intensity that they're doing in Beirut right now. There's 80 bombs. I mean, they can do that relatively easy here because uh, there's no air defense systems. Well, there won't, be any over, there won't be any over Iran either, really, to speak of. But more importantly is, you know, Lebanon is like a five-minute flight from Israel. It's, it's, just, it's just right there. Iran is a significant flight. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not easy. It, it's going to require refueling, but it's more than that. It's going to re require these uh, bombs to come back and load up on bombs and fly out again. So it's, it's way harder, way, way harder. And maybe they're just waiting until, in a sense, they're finished with Beirut. They're finished with their big assignments in Lebanon before they take on a riskier, trickier, more difficult, logistically and in every other sense, assignment uh, over Iran. So, um, you know, again, hard to tell exactly what is causing the delay in Israel, but I suspect it is just they're busy. And, and uh, Israel has, unlike America, which has really, for all intents and purposes, at least and you know, with exception, if they go to war with China, but at least in every other region, uh, for all intents and purposes, the United States has no limitation on resources. It has enough fighters, enough bombs, enough aircraft carriers, enough uh, uh, air, air force bases in the Middle East to be able to pound Iran into dust fairly quickly with very little challenge, logistical challenges. Israel cannot do that. It is very, very difficult for Israel to do it. Um, 
Henrik says, so will, Iran warn, will Israel warn Iran beforehand? Well, it already has, right? Israel's already told them we're going after these targets. Israel's already said, I mean, we know that Israel will tell the Americans, partially because the Americans will know anyway, because it's crossing kind of American-controlled airspace, uh, Saudi airspace, Iraqi airspace, where America has a presence. Uh, and as soon as the Israelis tell the Americans, you know the Americans will tell the Iranians, the Americans will leak it in a second, right? So um, Iranians know, will know when it's, when it's coming. Um, one question is, why is Israel trying to destroy this underground bunker? Uh, it's already killed Nasrallah. What's it trying to do? Well, the belief is right now, and again, I don't have all the data. I don't have all the information, uh, but at least from sources that I am reading, that I am hearing from, uh, there's every reason to believe that in this bunker, in this very deep bunker, uh, sits the new Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hashim Salifadin. So um, Israel is basically trying to liquidate the new head of Hezbollah like a day after it was appointed. Like, and, and I think that will send an incredibly powerful message. You appoint them, we knock them off. You appoint them, we destroy them. And if we need to drop 80 bombs in order to get deep into your bunkers, we will. And we know where you are. You cannot hide from us, right? You think your bunkers are secure. You think you don't have spies, but we know everything about you. We're tracking everything you're doing. We have, obviously, sp Israel has spies in high places, but it also has the kind of electronics, surveillance, where it knows where they are. Now, it is a little bit bewildering, and this is typical Israeli, right, that they let the residents of the buildings know to evacuate. How do they know that this guy didn't evacuate when the buildings evacuated? You think he would? Uh, maybe they were waiting for him outside. I, I don't know. I mean, you don't usually let them know when you've got a high value target to destroy. So it'll be interesting to find out if at the end of the day they really do get Salafadin. Um, who I, I hope they do. Uh, I hope he dies another slow, agonizing death at the depth of the bunker. Uh, but we won't know probably uh, until later tonight, unless there's breaking news, or, or maybe even only tomorrow. But uh, that is uh, assumed to be the target of uh, the current uh, of the current attack.